Take your copy of God's Word and turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings 19. It was a year ago today that we really knew things were about to change. But we had no idea how much the world was really about to change. That's usually the way it is. We don't get a warning notice when big change is coming. But here we are. We've endured a worldwide pandemic. We've seen perhaps the greatest racial tension, certainly in my lifetime. And we've gone through a crazy and chaotic political season that's left our heads spinning. It's easy to see how there could be significant discouragement. And that's exactly what we know is taking place. Studies tell us that one in four teenagers have considered suicide. Senior adults spent much of the last year completely isolated. Some even unable to see family, children and grandchildren. All of us in between, there are many things that could cause us to despair whether we've endured COVID, someone we love, we've grieved because we've lost them to COVID. Maybe we've gone through the pain of seeing relationships broken through this tension that's a he said, she said environment. Or perhaps it's just the circumstances that have gotten us down. And we find ourselves like the individual we're going to look at in Scripture today, Elijah, in our own cave of despair and depression. But we've got good news. This is a place of hope, and we're listening to stories of hope. These are comeback stories. So the story of Elijah is a comeback from depression and despair and discouragement. But before we can even get to that, I, I need to give you a bit of a disclaimer. We're talking about depression today. But I want you to know that I'm speaking to a particular group of people, primarily. That's always the case when we gather on Sundays. I'm primarily speaking to those of you who already have begun a relationship with Jesus Christ. So there's a level of assumption that we'll draw from as we walk through the Scripture today. But because of that, it's important that you understand that I know from the outset there are types of depression, there are seasons of discouragement that are not simply spiritual. We recognize that in this church. We realize that sometimes there's the need for professional help. There may even occasionally be the need for medication. We affirm that. We believe that God has placed us in an environment and all the good things that we have access to are from Him. And that's okay. If you're at a place where for example, you're maybe seeing things that others are saying are not reality or you're viewing the world in a way that seems greatly distorted or the people around you are in that category. It may be that they need professional help rather quickly. Another reason that you may need to respond quickly is if you're seriously considering taking your life. We recognize that this season of depression has affected everyone. This week I was with about 10 of the leading large church pastors in our nation. We were gathering to pray, and everyone in the room was talking about their discouragement. All of us know pastors that have taken their lives in the last year. If you get to that point, we want you to know there's always immediate help in addition to your cry out to God. And we live in a nation that recognizes that, and so perhaps you may want to take down this number for yourself or someone in your little corner of the world. It's the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. It's 1-800-273-8255. You'll never find us in this place diminishing the reality of mental or emotional illness. And if you've battled that, I, I need you to hear that I believe, according to Scripture, you can be mentally ill just as clearly as you are physically ill. The chemicals in your body can be out of whack just like things in your body may cause cancer or other diseases. And we would want you to get help. 
But I want you to understand that primary audience I'm speaking to. We're gathered in a house of God as children of God. And if you are a child of God, there's something that you need to understand. And that is that Scripture teaches us that we really do have what we need. In fact, it's Peter, one of the apostles, that says in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, His divine power, whose power? His power. Who's Him? God. God's power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Say all things. God's power has granted to you who are children of God all things. Say all things. Pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him. Now, who is this Him? This is through Jesus. We gather Uh, under our Father God, recognizing that the Son of God, Jesus, gave gave His life for us so that we can have a relationship with Him and live filled with the Holy Spirit of God. So the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and to His excellence. Just as we've sung, when we turn our eyes upon Jesus and live for His glory, the things of this world can begin to grow dim, and we can overcome what we're facing. All that we need, according to Scripture, is found in the Scriptures. God's giving that to us. So if you're not a child of God, the first step, if you're dealing with discouragement or even depression, is to come to Jesus. And I want you to know that that's possible. That though the Bible says you, like me, were separated from God because of sin in your life, that God doesn't want that. And the whole reason that Jesus came and was born in a baby and lived a perfect life as a man and died on a criminal's cross, the whole reason he raised from the dead is so that he could offer to you forgiveness through his grace and life that comes through a relationship with him. And it would be my prayer. In fact, I've been praying this for days, that if you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that this is the day of your salvation. That's the first step. Because when we come to Jesus, we know that he cares for us. And he tells us that we can cast our cares on him, the one who cares for us. What about if you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you're struggling with depression? If you were to come into one of our offices and sit down with one of our pastoral counselors, the first thing we would ask you would deal with sin in your life. You see, we recognize that there are consequences to sin. And so as a follower of Christ, if you're living with unconfessed sin in your life, then it's not a really surprising thing that you may be dealing with discouragement and despair, despondency, and even depression. We learn that sin has all kinds of consequences. It causes all kinds of havoc in our life. So let me just give you an example, right? We know that sin is those things that we do that God said don't do. So if there are some things... I do that God said don't do, like if I'm involved, say, in sexual immorality or I'm putting things into my body that are not healthy for my body. If, if that's the case, I'm sinning in those ways. That's just two examples. But it would not be surprising that those have impact on my life and cause me even to deal with discouragement and depression. But sin is also those good things God tells me to do that I don't do. So God tells me to ingest his word, to digest his word, to study his word. And if I don't do that, guess what? That's sin. And so if you're discouraged or you're depressed, but you're not spending any time in God's word, the first thing I would tell you to do is get into God's word. Because as you're going to hear today, that's how he speaks to us. You hear God through his word, and, and maybe that alone would help you. If you're not spending time in prayer, the same thing. God says to pray without ceasing That means that we can pray continually. We don't have to just be in a church service or or we don't have to kneel by our bedside or at the dinner table to pray. We can just say, oh yeah, God, I'm facing this and I need your help in this moment. And if you're not praying regularly, that would be a first step because you're, you're sinning by that lack of prayer in your life. What if you're a child of God who has confessed your sin and yet you're still living in discouragement and despair? And you're thinking, what? Why? How? You're just filled with questions. I want to tell you that I believe God has the answers. And that's why this message is so important. So I want, us to, I want to invite us to pray once more. Because I believe in the power of prayer. You were prayed for before you ever came in this room. 
before you ever turned on this platform with which you're watching this service, before you ever listened to this message, you were prayed for. And, and so I want to pray again that God would use this time for our good and His glory. So Father, in the name of Jesus, that's our prayer. Oh, would you give us what we're still lacking that we need? Would you teach us those things that cause us to walk in ignorance because we don't know them? Would you make us men and women, even boys and girls, that we can be for your glory? We want to be different. We, we don't want to be same as the world. And we want to walk through this wild season of life with the best of our ability for your glory. So speak and give us ears to hear. God, I pray that you would do the miraculous. I pray that you would heal marriages as a result of what takes place in these next few moments. God, I pray that you would break the bonds of addiction because of what takes place in this gathering. God, I pray that you would change attitudes, that you would mend broken hearts, that, that you would restore the joy of salvation because we've, we've become in, in tune with you and, and we've listened to you and we've walked away changed. So, Father, may the words I say and even the meditation, the thoughts in these moments, protect them, God. There's so many distractions. Protect them so that they may be of you. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus for your glory. Amen. You see, you're going to recognize that Elijah too had questions. But in the midst of his questioning time, God had a question for him. I want to point you to that and then we'll rewind and bring you back up to date. In 1 Kings 19, where I ask you to turn, in verse 13, you see God coming to Elijah in a literal cave, in the midst of depression and despair, and God says to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And I just want to remind you, God knows your name. And if you're at that place where you're in the cave you're in the dungeon of despair. I really believe as clearly as I'm standing today that the God of the universe would speak into your life and he would say, what are you doing here? I want you to come back. I've got more for you. I've got bigger things and greater things for you. So let me help you understand how we got to this point. We first came in contact, in contact with Elijah in the context of 1 Kings 17 with a specific encounter with God. And that's what God does. He still encounters us. It may not be in a burning bush or, or it may not be in a literal cave, but God wants to encounter us. Look at Elijah's encounter. 1 Kings 17 verse 1. Now Elijah, he was from Tishbe and Gilead. And, and this is important in Scripture because these are real people. These are real people who lived, and they're not fictitious characters. You need to understand that because it, it helps us see what God can do in our lives. He told King Ahab, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. Elijah was a prophet. Now you hear some people call themselves prophets today, but the truth is the biblical prophets were different. There was no Bible. There was not the written Word of God. So the biblical prophets, they would, they would give the message of God to the people who needed to hear the message. And so we're told that Elijah was a prophet of God. And, and in this story, he goes to the king and he tells the king, hey, God has said there's not going to be any rain. And you know what happens when there's no rain? It creates a dry season. And some of you, you've, you've walked into this room, and you're in a dry season. Maybe you're spiritually dry. Perhaps you're just mentally or emotionally dry, or, or you're physically dry. You can relate to what we're about to study. I look at the pages of Scripture, and I see this verse, the first verse of 1 Kings 17, and I, I see some things about Elijah that are striking to me. First of all, it says, Elijah is a servant of the living God. Do you know that we have a living God? I have now spent uh, half my life, 25 years, 
hanging out with folks like you, and I'm deeply convicted that most of the people that sit in seats in churches don't live as if we really believe that we have a living God. We live as if there's some distant deity that we can't really know, that that we can't really relate to. And that's why we don't look any different than our neighbors when we go through times of stress or disease or difficulty or challenge because we haven't interacted with the living God. Elijah says, I am from the living God. That's the whole message of the gospel, that Jesus came and he lived, and though he died, he rose again, and he lives today. We serve a living God. But it's not just that he had a living God. It's that he was a servant of God. And what does a servant do? The servant does what the master says. What does the servant say? The servant says what the master says. That's what a servant is. We too are supposed to be servants of the living God. But guess what? That's the reason the world doesn't see us as different. Because we're not doing what the master says. We're not saying what the master says. It's hard to think that we speak from God. And if you don't have those first two things... If you don't have the recognition that there's a living God, and if you're not living your life as a servant, then you're not going to do the third thing I want you to see from that very first verse about Elijah, and that is that he had confidence in God. So he could go to the king and says, hey, here's what my God told me to tell you. There's not going to be any rain for a long time. And if you don't understand that God's alive and he wants you to be his servant, you're not going to walk in that kind of confidence. And the confidence of Elijah just grew and grew and grew. It grew because he saw God's provision. He, he went to a, a brook, and, and there at the brook, this little stream, when he had nothing to eat, the Bible says God provided for him at the brook of Cherith by ravens. I mean, isn't God amazing? He had no food, and God brought him food from the birds. Why did God do that? Because that's what God does. He specializes in making something out of nothing. He would then go to see this widow lady. And when he would go see this widow lady, God told him to ask her for bread. But there was a problem. When he went to her, she said, I only got enough for one little pan of bread for me and my son. And then we were just going to eat it and say, let's die together. Good morning. God bless you. Have a good day. I mean, think about that. That's cheery. And and God says, no, no, no. Tell her, just trust me. Just continue to walk in faith, and I'm going to meet the needs. And guess what? She had enough oil and enough flour to make bread, and it just continued and continued and continued, and she never ran out. Why? Because God specializes in making something out of nothing. By the way, Jesus would demonstrate this, right? He would gather with the disciples. He was just teaching because really when the power of God shows up and the word of God is spoken, people begin to gather. And so people had begun to gather and there were several thousand people there and it was lunchtime and their stomachs were growling. And Jesus looked at the disciples. He said, what y'all bring to eat? And they were like, nothing. And was that a problem for Jesus? No, because God specializes in making something out of nothing. And so sometimes, church, get ready for this because I've been setting it up. Sometimes God will let you get back down to nothing so that you can understand he wants to do something in your life. He specializes in making something out of nothing. And, And so then the lady's boy, he drops dead. What does Elijah do? God uses Elijah to bring him back to life. And so this woman is seeing this prophet who's walking in the confidence of God. And she says in verse 24, now I know for sure you're a man of God and the Lord truly speaks through you. And that's the way God wants you to be looked at in your little corner of the world. He wants our lives to be lived in such confidence as servants of the living God that the people around us see, I I can see what you've got. I want some of that. Just think, just think about that. I mean, this sets up who Elijah is. But then God tells Elijah, hey, I'm going to deal with this drought. Three years passed. 
1 Kings 18 verse 1 says, Later on the third year of the drought, the Lord said to Elijah, Go and present yourself to King Ahab and tell him, I will soon send rain." Now remember what took place. The people of God, after they got into the promised land, after Joshua died, they didn't know God, and so they said, we need a king, and God gave them a king. They got Saul. He wasn't a great king. Then they got David. He was a man after God's own heart. Then they got Solomon. Then they went through a period where they had good kings, bad kings, good kings, bad kings, and you get to Ahab, and he is a bad king. He's not a good king. And so God is setting up, in the act of this miracle of rain, he's setting up an interaction between the man of God, Elijah, and the bad king. Because God wants us to know that he's always willing and preparing his voice, even in the midst of difficult and dark times. So Elijah does what God commands him. And he gathers the people together. And and there are some that have been followers of God and some that were these pagan people. He goes to Ahab and, and Ahab says, hey, is that really you, Elijah? You're a troublemaker. He calls him a name. What does Elijah do? Remember, he's walking in the confidence of God. Look at verse 18. He says, I made no trouble here. You and your family are the troublemakers. Ha! When you walk in the confidence of God, you've got the boldness of God to speak truth even into power. He's walking in the confidence of God, and so he's setting up the decision that's there. And and it's a reminder of what we're facing today because God brings us to a place where we have a choice. Verse 21, it says, Elijah stood in front of them and said, how much longer will you waver? Bobbling between two opinions. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people were completely silenced. And that that makes me think about what happens every time we hear the word of God. You're at a crossroads of choice. And you've got to decide, am I going to walk out of here forgetting what I've heard and not applying the word of God and leaving it, this experience, this moment, like a crumpled piece of paper on the seat that I've left? Or am I going to walk about change, walk out change? I've got a choice. I get to decide how I'm going to respond. So Elijah sets up this competition. What, is he, what he's going to do is he's going to allow all these other false prophets, 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah, he's going to allow them to call on their false gods and light the fire if they can. So he has them build an altar, put an animal on it, and says, pray to your God and see if he'll light the fire. And then he said, I'm going to do the same. And we'll see if my God lights the fire. That's what he says in verse 24. Then call on the name of the Lord your God. I'll call on the name of the Lord, the God who answers by setting fire to the wood is the true God. And all the people agreed. So they did it. They went first. That's what he said. Y'all go first. (laughs) So they went first. They built their altar. They began to cry. They began to dance. They began to moan. They began to say, oh, God. Nothing happened. That sets up one of the funniest verses in all the Bible. Verse 27. It says about noontime, Elijah began mocking them. Na, 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 boo, boo. <laughs> Y'all need to shout louder, he scoffed. For surely he's a God. Perhaps he's daydreaming. Or he's relieving himself. Y'all know what that means? In the back, y'all know what that means? That's in the Bible. I didn't make that up. Oh, your God's not answering. Maybe he took a pit stop. Maybe he's at the bathroom. Or maybe he's just away on a trip or he's asleep or he needs to be wakened. Nothing happened. Then Elijah built his altar. After he put the animal there, he said, put, put water around it in a trench. And then drench the animal and the altar and the wood and then fill the trench. And then it says in verse 36, as usual, When the usual time for the offering, the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and he prayed, Oh Lord, oh Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you're God in Israel, that I'm your servant. Prove that I've done all this at your command. Oh Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you're Lord, that you're God, that you've brought them back. To yourself. Now let me just pause right there and tell you that teaches us something about prayer. 
if you're going to pray biblically, it's okay to tell God, I'm ready for you to do what you say you're going to do. Your word teaches that we're supposed to pray this. So God, I'm, I'm asking you to do what you've already said you're going to do. Prove it, God. You're, you're not doing anything wrong when you pray that way. You're doing something wrong when you don't have faith. Oh God, if, 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 if you can do this or if you would do this. By the way, in this service last week, can I just tell you something? We prayed for three young men. One of them was in ICU in the hospital from COVID. He had been asleep, by the way, for two weeks. And with no medication, he was still awake. One of them had been hit by a car Friday night, doubled over and thrown 20 feet in the air. The third one of them was in a tragic automobile accident six months earlier. He had one of his legs amputated, and he was having a surgery on Friday. Can I give you an update? Lucas, the boy in Jacksonville in ICU, is coming home from the hospital today. Giannis, the boy hit by a car last Friday night, walked out of the hospital earlier this week. And Jacob, the young man who came to Christ through the ministry of this church several years ago, he had a successful surgery on Friday. Why? Because when you call out to God, He answers you. Verse 38, immediately. Say immediately. Immediately, immediately the fire fell. You know, that's what we need, the fire to fall. And it flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and they cried out. Remember what the old lady said? Listen to what they said. The Lord, He is God. Yes, the Lord is God. When you live in the confidence of who God is and what He can do and in His power, when you walk forward in faith, the people in your little corner of the world see that He is God. And when you don't, they don't. But that's not the end of the story. It's pretty amazing. Remember there were all these prophets, 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asher. When all this happened, you know what Elijah did? He had them killed. You, you guys are out of here, false prophets, bunch of fakes, fake news. He had them killed. And then, then God tells him, to call down the rain. And this is what Elijah said. He said, I, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. Now we can understand that, can't we? We're about to go into a few months of every afternoon. We'll hear the sound of abundance of rain. But here's what's interesting. Nobody heard the rain. Elijah said, I hear the sound of abundance of rain, but nobody heard the rain. In fact, Elijah called his servant, and he said, hey, Zelvis, run over to the uh, sea and come back and tell me it's raining. And he came back, and he said, hey, Elijah, it ain't raining. All the while, the, the Bible says... That Elijah, I'm not going to act this out, but it says he was knelt in prayer with his head between his legs. He said, go back. And the servant came back and said, no, it's not raining. Sorry to tell you, it's not raining. Seven times. The seventh time, the servant came back and he says, hey, Way out in the sea, there's a cloud that looks like a little fist. I think the rain's coming. And all the while, Elijah's saying, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. I hear. See, Elijah saw it before he saw it. That's what faith is. Faith is not, I walk with God, I do for God, I live for God, just when I can figure it out, when I understand, when I see it. It's going forward when it doesn't even make sense to others, because God is a God who does the impossible. 
That's what he did this morning in my Bible reading. I'm, I'm in Luke chapter 1, and, and I read about how God says to Mary, hey, no big deal. I know you've not been with Joseph. It's not a big deal because nothing is impossible with me. That's who God is. That's what he, that's what he does. So the servant says, the rain's coming. And uh, Elijah says, one more thing. Go tell the king, King Ahab, he better get in his buggy and start traveling. Because if he doesn't, he's not getting back to the palace before the storm comes. And so he goes, he, goes, <laughs> he tells him that. Ahab gets in the buggy, the chariot, he starts going back to the palace. And then you're not going to believe this. God gives Elijah supernatural speed. He turns him into the flash. It's amazing. He says he runs down the mountain. I've been on the top of that mountain. I've looked down in the valley. It's amazing. It says he runs down the mountain and he runs ahead of the chariot and beats him to the palace. Our God is able. Now, when we hear these stories, we tend to think, I shouldn't have used the example of the flash because we tend to think this is like Marvel comments or this is fiction now, listen to what the Bible says in James chapter 5 and verse 17. Elijah was as human as we are. See, God gives us these people so that we can re recognize that's what God does. He, he works through people like us. It, it, these aren't superheroes. They're sinful human beings just like us. And so the the Bible says when, when Elijah prayed, the, the rains came down and the earth began to yield its crops. What a great story. It seems like everything is great. And then all of a sudden, you're going to turn the pages to chapter 19 and you realize, oh, Elijah is human just like us. Because here's the deal. Every one of us is capable of moments of deep and dark despair. And the way out, the way back will always be to listen for the still small voice of the Lord and to hear the word of God. That's the one thing I want you to walk away with today. Every one of us is capable of moments of deep and dark despair. And the way out of that, if you're in that today, the way back, if you want to have a comeback from despair and depression and discouragement today, the comeback is going to be to listen for the still small voice voice of the Lord and to hear the word of God. The servant of the Lord, the one whose master is the living of God, has seen miracle after miracle after miracle. But notice what happens next. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. And Elijah was afraid and he fled for his life. This man who had just killed 850 false prophets is scared of one woman. Just try that on for size. Fear causes us to think irrationally. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone to the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. Listen to this prayer. I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors who've already died. This is the guy who, when he spoke, God answered he raised a boy from the dead. He saw miracle after miracle filling his stomach. He called the fire down. Then he called the rain down. And now this woman's hurt his feelings. And he said, oh, God, just, I want to die. Just take, him, take, me, take me home. And that's depression's prayer, by the way, for the, for the child of God. That's how it sounds. So, so don't think it's spiritual just to say, I'm... I just want to go on to heaven. No, that's usually a sign you're, you're struggling with discouragement or depression. Because while this world is not our permanent home, it's our temporary home. And when we get to the place, if we're healthy and we just say, hey, I'm just ready to go. What we're saying is, I, I don't like it here. I can't take it anymore. And that's exactly what he was doing. 
We always get into trouble when we think our problems are bigger than our God. Your biggest problem is still smaller than our big God. Then he lay down and he slept under the broom tree. Again, that's what depression does. You want to go, just go to bed. But he was sleeping and an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. And he looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar full of water. And he drank and he lay down again. And then the angel of the Lord came to him again. Now, this may be a theophany, just like we believe Moses had at the burning bush. This may have been Jesus himself in the Old Testament coming to him and talking to him. And he says, get up and eat, eat, eat some more. Or the, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. Now, what's he saying there? Hey, the reason you're going to get up, Elijah, is because you're about to go on a journey. And, and some of you, you're focused on what's going on in the cave. And so you're not even seeing that God's got a path for you. He's got a journey he wants to take you on. He's not finished. He's doing something fresh and new. So you got to get up. And so he got up and he ate and he drank. And the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, to the mountain of God. Now, we know he's going to a holy place, the mountain of God. But did you pick up on something 40 days and 40 nights? Sometimes God's heard you. Sometimes God's working. And that still doesn't mean he's going to do things overnight. Sometimes the journey he has you on toward healing may be a process. You may need to spend some time in the wilderness in order for him to bring you through this. So there he came to a cave. <laughs> And he spent the night. It's like he had a magnetic draw to these places of depression. And some of you are that way. You, you came up and you, you're at, at church today or you're listening to this message today. Or you're, you're watching this. And, and yet, if, if you don't fight it, you can just turn this off. You're going to put this down. You're going to walk away and just go back to the cave. The Lord said to him, what, what are you doing here, Elijah? And so that same question I believe the Lord would ask of us, you know, what, what are you doing? What, what do you really want to come out of this? How do you want things to change? Are you, are you going to be content just going through these motions? I know you're, you say you're discontent, but what are you really doing here? Notice the response. This is great. Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. They've torn down your altars. They've killed every one of the prophets. I'm the only one left. Now they're trying to kill me too. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I think I'm going to the garden and eating worms. <laughs> and that's his mentality. Nobody understands what I'm going. That's what depression does, friend. You walk through this difficult time and you think nobody gets it. Nobody else has ever been through what I'm going through. And yet one of the beauties of the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, the church, the fellowship as it's called in the New Testament, is that you come together and you realize there's a lot of people in your same boat. You're not alone. So God responds, go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And Elijah stood there, and the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind was there, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a the sound of a gentle whisper. Now listen to this. Some of you, you know where you think you are, but you've been trying all these other things to get out. And the Lord's not in it. Because you've not turned to him first. When the Lord speaks to you, he's not going to do it the same way he did someone else. I think the reason we have the example that there was a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire, is because he wanted Elijah to know, Elijah, I'm not coming to you in the fire like I did Moses. He doesn't always come in the same way. But he always comes when you call him. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in the cloak and he went out and he stood in the entrance of the cave and a voice said, What are you doing here, Elijah? <laughs> this is funny. Did you pick up on it? God's already asked him that. But he didn't get it. So God had to get his attention. So he had like a tornado come through. He had an earthquake come through. Then he had a forest fire come through. And then he whispers. What are you doing here, Elijah? The 
the same thing he had said before. Think Elijah got it? Nope. He replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God. He, he must think God's just hard of hearing. I've zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, they've killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left. Now they're trying to kill me. Then the Lord said to him, go back. Go back the same way you came. Travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazel to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be king of Israel. Then anoint Elijah, son of Shaphat, to, from the town of Abel Mahola, to, to replace you as my prophet. And anyone who escapes from Hazel will be killed by Jehu. And those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elijah. By the way, what's he saying? I'm going to take care of it all the way through. If I'm telling you to do something, I'm going to provide for you while I do it. If God asks you to live in obedience for him, he's going to give you the strength. He's going to give you the power. He's going to lift you up and help you do that. And then he says, and yet, by the way, I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. So listen to this, big boy. You're not the only one. There's 7,000 others who they've been just as strong as you. And interestingly, by the way, no sign that God had to show up for them in this kind of way. Maybe they had greater faith than he had in this moment. So Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, plowing a field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plowing with the 12th team. And Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak on his shoulders and walked away. That's a way of saying in those times that you're going to take my role you're now going to be the prophet of God. So Elijah left the oxen standing there. He ran after Elijah, and he said to him, First, let me go and kiss my father and mother goodbye, then I'll go with you. And Elijah replied, Go back, but think about what I've done to you. God was at work. Now remember our main truth. Everyone, say everyone. Every one of us is capable of these deep and dark moments of prayer, despair, depression, discouragement. But the way back, the comeback, the way out is always going to be to listen. For that still, small voice of the Lord. To hear the word of God. At the beginning of chapter 19, Elijah's depressed. Everything looked great on the outside. But on the inside, his soul was weary. There's victory on the outside. He just beat the king. But he was living defeated on the inside. He was winning on the outside, but he was filled with worry. On the inside. And that's where some of you are. And I just want you to know that. I know that not because I'm the Holy Spirit. I'm not. But I, I know that's because how, that's how we are. Particularly in rooms like this. We, we put our mask on. And we clean up. And, and somebody says, how are you doing? And you go, great. Great. Doing great. And, but we're dying on the inside. And that's why I think we can learn from Elijah. In fact, there are some factors that I think led to Elijah's depression that you need to be aware of. One of them was exhaustion. And he had reason to be exhausted, right? We walked through everything that he had experienced. I mean, he was physically, probably mentally, emotionally, and even spiritually exhausted. And we've already learned that when you get worn out, goodness, you get burned out, often you fall out. That's why God created the Sabbath, so that, that we could rest. You, you're, nobody's the Energizer Bunny. You can't go and go and go and think everything's going to be okay. You either are going to fall into disobedience or you're going to fall into depression. That's why Jesus, even Jesus, would pull apart from the crowds just to spend time with the Father. Because he taught us if you don't come apart, you will come apart. Exhaustion. Then there's fear and, and worry. This is why scripture tells us not to fear. 365 plus times, more than once a day, you could say, you could hear God say to you, do not fear. That's why Jesus would say, why are you creatures worrying? I made everything. I, the birds, you know how they fly? I put them in the air. You know those flowers you like? You cut them down and you put them in the vases even way back then. We have the ceramics that, where they put flowers in vases. You know how you do that? Because I made them grow out of the ground. But they're not the crown of my creation. You are. Why, why are you worried? That's why Paul would say, hey, church, be anxious for nothing but in everything. Say everything. everything. 
with prayer and supplication. Make your request known to God with thanksgiving. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, the peace of God from the Prince of Peace, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. And so when you give into this, when you get overcome with exhaustion and you begin to worry all the time, depression has all these physical symptoms. You, you have sleep issues. You, you begin to care less. You have, you're apathetic about the world. You, you don't even eat. You don't want to eat. You have, you, you have a loss of appetite. If you're married, you, you may have intimacy issues. You, you don't want to be physically together. You go through physical pain, back pains, migraines, headaches, all these things. And then, of course, emotional pain. All of these things just manifested through depression. So you see the path he's on. He was exhausted. He was fearful. And then he was isolated. Because that's what we do, right? We pull back from others or we push them away. It's just a sign of depression. I don't want to be around you. I don't have the energy. I don't have anything left to give to anybody else is the way we say it. But being alone just makes us more depressed because you weren't created to be alone. And then in Elijah we see assumption. You know what I mean by that? He just assumed that he had the answers. He assumed he was the only one left. He assumed nobody could understand. It's a glass half empty attitude. Just always walking around negative. Always finding a reason why this won't work. Why this can't be okay. And all of this I think also comes back to perspective. See, what we see in chapter 17 and chapter 18, seven different times it says, Elijah listened to the word of the Lord. And God did the miraculous. But now he's not listening to the word of the Lord. (laughs) He's listening to the voices in his head. You better run. Jezebel's going to beat you. (laughs) He's taking his eyes off God and he put his eyes on his circumstances. And when your perspective changes in that way, It's going to lead you into depression. So remember God's question? Through that path, what are you doing here? What are you doing here, Elijah? Because everyone, even these mighty prophets of God, everyone, say everyone, everyone's capable of moments of deep and dark despair. And the way out, the way back will always be to listen for the still small voice of the Lord, to hear the word of God. So what does the Lord say to us in those moments? What does God say in the midst of despair? This is great because it's straight off the pages of scripture and it's easy. You ready? First of all, he says, get up. See, when we're, disp- when we're depressed, we don't want to get up. One of the signs of depression is you just want to pull the covers in over your head. You just want to sleep. You want to stay in bed. You're tired. He says, get up. Because there's a point. Remember, you've got to make a choice. There's a point where you've got to decide, am I content to be discontent? Or am I going to get the help I need? So he says, get up. And then he says, go out. Because he knows if he got up, number one, he better watch his head because he's in a cave. But if he doesn't go out, he's still in the cave. So it's not just getting up. It's understanding you got to go back out into the world. Some of you, that means you got to get back into a Bible study group. you you got to be more faithful worshiping. Some of you that are maybe even watching this, you've come to a place where this fear of this disease has so crippled you that you're not even getting out of your home. And and that fear and that worry is causing you more pain, more illness than the virus could possibly cause. And he might be saying, get out. And then he says something interesting. He says, go back. Now, why does he say go back? He's telling him to go back where you've come from. What would he do if he went back where he came from? He would remember how God worked in his past. And the first thing you remember about what God's done in your past, if you're a child of God, is that he saved you. He picked you up, he turned you around, he put your feet on solid ground. You are changed. So maybe you just need to be reminded, according to Scripture, of what that means. If you are a child of God, you're not what the devil says you are. You know what? You're not what those people that don't like you say you are. 
You're, you're not what the ungodly say you are. If you are a child of God, that means you were created in the image of God. You're God's image bearer. You are a new creation. All the old has gone away. The Bible calls you a friend of God. It calls you a saint. That is who you are. Go back and look and see who God has made you and then look at what he's done. Think about those times he's answered your prayer. And then get busy. Because he's got something for you to do. See, one of the things that happens in depression is we turn inward and we stop doing. And I just want to remind you that we believe scripturally that when God saves you, he doesn't save you just to sit and soak it in. He, see, he saves you to serve. He saves you to be sent. And, and some of you, if you poured out, it would help you. Because when you just sit and you soak, what happens? You sour. And some of you, the souring in your life is because you've not given out. You, you've not given back. And, and then he says, get together. He says, go find Elijah. In other words, I've got a friend for you. I've got a friend for you. So he's saying, hey, you don't have to do this alone. I've got somebody to help you. You were never intended to do this alone. We are better together, church. We're better as we come together and realize one day I'm going to be limping or one day you're going to be hoarse or someday you're not going to be able to go forward. But together we carry one another and we encourage one another and we equip one another and we bless one another and we're better together. Because every one of us is capable of moments of deep and dark despair and the way out or the way back will always be to listen for the still small voice of the Lord to hear the word of God now why because <laughs> he's not finished with you if you're here he's not finished with you I don't care how bad you feel I don't care how dark it seems I don't care what's going on around you if you're here your creator's not finished with you how do I know that? Because he wasn't finished with Elijah. I think that's why he told him to get up. He said, Elijah, you haven't even, you haven't even met Elisha yet, and he's going to be your successor. I'm not finished with you. And Elisha, you, you haven't even seen that I'm going to answer Jezebel's prayer too. I'm going to let her die just like she said needs to happen. I'm not finished with you. And Elijah, by the way, I've got a chariot prepared for you, but it's not like one you've ever ridden in. This chariot you're going to get in, and it's just going to take off like it's going to outer space. And nobody's going to know where you are because I'm not finished with you. Because after that, Elijah, you're going to show up with Moses, who you've read about, and who Jesus, who you're prophesying about, on the Mount of Transfiguration. Because Elijah, I'm not finished with you. And I believe he was saying, and guess what, Elijah? At the end of time, when Jesus comes back, there's going to be two witnesses. And I think you're one of those witnesses. And I'm not finished with you. And God is not finished with you. He has more things for you. Yes, for your good. But most of all, for his glory, he's not finished with you. So what are you doing here? <laughs> what are you doing just hanging out in the cave? It's not all he's got for you. Don't stay there. I know what it's like. I've had those days. I've had those days in ministry even where I feel like just quitting. What if the hand of God is even on my life? I've had those days as a husband where I think I'm just, I'm not any good. I'm not a good husband. I've had those days as a parent. But you can't quit. You got to get up. Now, how do we hear that small voice? If you're a child of God, here's the good news. The Spirit of God is in you. He's not some force that comes through the vents when we turn on the smoke. The Spirit of God is not a chill bump you get when you sing a song you like. The Spirit of God is a person and the Bible says that when you begin a relation, not when you reach a certain level of maturity in your faith, not but 
when you act a certain way or, or do something that everybody else doesn't understand, when you cross the faith line, when you begin a relationship with God, the Spirit of God comes into you and He always is there. So when you need Him, you just listen for His voice. And the great news is, that same Spirit spoke to men that were human just like us. And inspired by the Holy Spirit, they wrote the Bible. And every time I open the Bible, I can hear God's voice. And one of the things I read is that the God of the Bible, He says, come. You who are weary, you're depressed, you're heavy laden, you're discouraged. Come. Come. And I'll give you rest. Bow your heads with me. If you're a Christ follower right now, I want to ask you just to begin to cry out to God. Because I'm, I'm convinced and maybe even to the point of convicted that there are many who professed Christ that have let the things of this world cloud our view. And we're living and we're talking and we're acting irrationally. And our lost friends and family members, they would have no interest in our God because we don't look any different. And if that's you, I, I beg you in the name of Jesus, take this as a moment of repentance and confession before Him. Determine not to walk away the same as you walked in. But there's somebody, I, I know there's somebody who's hearing these words that has never begun a relationship with God. You need him. He's the answer. Jesus is the answer. So I want to remind you again, you need him because you were born apart from him. That's what sin does. But God doesn't want it to stay that way. That's why Jesus came. And because he's alive, he can handle anything you can handle. He gives you the power because he has all the power. But you've got to trust Him and what He's already done. The Bible puts it this way. You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Remember what it means to have a Lord? He's the Master. We do what the Master says. We say what the Master wants us to say. If your life is not character, characterized by that, you maybe should ask the question, even if you think you have that relationship with God, have I ever been saved? If you want to be saved today, I want to invite you to cry out to God. You don't need me. There's no magic prayer, but sometimes it just helps to have somebody guiding us through. Maybe you could pray words like this to Jesus. Say, dear Jesus, thank you. Just tell him thank you already. I know you love me. Even though I'm a sinner. And you died for me. Even though I deserve to die. And you're alive today. I receive your forgiveness. Thank you, Jesus. And I surrender my life to you. You are my Lord. From this moment on, you're my Lord. You're in control, not me. You're in control. I'm going to follow you. I tell him thank you.